So I guess I get another shot at convincing you about all the evils of treatments with Hep CR here. So we're going to talk about long-term toxicity. I think you know it's clear that we do not cure this disease today. We may be with some of the new drugs eventually, but right now we don't. And so we don't want to do a lot of a lot of harm, and we have to think about potential long-term toxicity when we start deciding what treatment to, to give to a patient. So I thought this would have been shown about 10 times by now. Um, but clearly, over the years, we've gotten better in terms of response rates and CR rates. And um, we've also done that by introducing new drugs and combinations. And with that, we develop additional toxicities. And it's always a trade-off of uh, toxicity and benefit. So this is what I thought we would have heard so far, and I was looking at the title. So it's a disease of the immune system. It's aberrant proliferation, both cell proliferation, but also uh, aberrant cell death. T53 is important. Uh, it's a genetic disease. Current therapy is pretty much chemoimmunotherapy, so rituximab plus chemotherapy of your choice. And until we can cure it, our goal is to prolong survival. And since that survival is prolonged, we do want to consider all these uh, options and what we're doing to patients and not do more harm than good. So what are the chemotherapy toxicities we're worried about? Primarily myelosuppression with infection and bleeding. Uh, inability to tolerate subsequent therapy. So if you burn your bridges so that uh, prolonged cytopenias and you can't get treatments two and three in, you may have actually not done the patient any good. We'll talk a little bit about the uh, threat of therapy-related myeloid neoplasia, which is the current term for MDS slash AML, secondary to treatment. Uh, so in the, you have the myeloid compartment, you have the lymphoid compartment with prolonged B-cell immunosuppression, uh, decreased gamma globulins, risk of infection, prolonged T-cell suppression, which we consider more with fludarabine, but bendamustine has some and the risk of opportunistic infections and viral infections more than uh, typical uh, 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 infections. And fortunately, really, it's myeloid and lymphoid. We don't have a lot. We don't use doxorubicin and worry about cardiotoxicity and bleomycin with pulmonary and things like that. So we're fortunate that most of our drugs are really myeloid and lymphoid uh, toxicities. So if we're worried about toxicity, we don't want to cause problems that the disease already causes. And so what do people die of with CLL? So I looked it up to date, and it says most frequent causes are infection in about 50 percent, bleeding, and basically failure to thrive. Uh, we've heard a little bit so far about transformation, and that can come in two forms, either prolymphocytic, sort of a gradual accumulation of large prolymphocytes and true acute transformation to an aggressive lymphoma-type presentation of Richter syndrome, and also second malignancies, which are increased in incidence in patients with CLL. So what are the causes of infection? Well, neutropenia, abnormal B cells, abnormal T cells, and spleens that don't work right. So when you look at it, fludarabine definitely causes neutropenia. Bendamustine clearly causes neutropenia. They both cause T cell dysfunction, probably fludarabine better characterized. I don't think there's a lot of evidence that they have a lot of B cell dysfunction. That comes more from the rituximab we throw in there. And I don't think there's much data that these affect spleen function, but clearly they could have some effect on stromal cells and interaction with the spleen. I put the column on novel agents up there because, as you heard a little bit, we don't you know, we, we need to know more about these in the short and long-term uh, effects. If BTK is critical for B-cell development, then knocking out BTK function might have some long-term effects on B-cells and things like that. So I think as we were all excited about these new agents, we have to sort of look down the line in the patients who are responding, what kind of toxicities are we going to start to see, how that's going to affect what we can combine, and how we can safely use these drugs. So infection is from the disease as well as the treatment. Uh, there are some things we can do to try to limit that, and those are the kinds of things that we do, vaccinations. Uh, I'm quite amazed, actually. I've been impressed. The Cleveland Clinic has this very active uh, health maintenance, and they tell you when you should have this done and that done. But they haven't quite figured out that live vaccination with herpes zoster vaccine is not such a good idea in patients with underlying lymphoid malignancies. So I have to re-educate them about that. But certainly flu vaccine, yes, IVIG in the proper patients uh, 
myeloid growth factors and treatment with anti antibiotics. Thrombocytopenia, again, multifactorial, bone marrow infiltration, splenic uh, spleen acting as a sink, and ITP, which you just heard about from Dr. Haberman. And then we make that worse with our treatments, and we can make it really worse if we cause myelodysplasia, and then we have real uh, long-term problems. And again, the novel agents, uh, I think we need to wait and see how they are going to uh, uh, have an effect in the long term uh, in thrombocytopenia. So I wasn't really expecting this discussion all morning about transformation, but it's sort of interesting. Um, and it raises the question, as, it was, as was discussed, you know, are we preventing it by reducing tumor burden? Are we selecting for the bad guys who then grow out because they're no longer suppressed by the clone? Or are we inducing DNA damage, which can uh, give those cells a growth advantage? Um, don't know the answer, but you know, when you look at Richter's transformation, about, depending on who you read, roughly half the patients have a clone that's related to the CLL clone. So presumably then that is an evolution or clonal selection. But in some patients, uh, it's a different clone, not the same as the original CLL clone. Before that, we said, oh, well, that's a different clone. Now we say, well, maybe that was a subclone that was undetected. So again, with the new uh, sequencing tools we have, we really need to revisit this, I think, uh, and figure that out. But uh, we do have to be aware that we could enhance uh, transformation as well as prevent it. Um, and second, malignancies, there's a literature on increased incidence of melanoma, non-small cell lung cancer, and things like that. And not only the increased incidence, but these patients do worse stage for stage in any of the cancers that have been studied than patients who do not have underlying CLL. Again, is that because they can't tolerate the treatment? Is that because their immune surveillance mechanisms are off? Not so much known about that. So I've listed again here are the long-term concerns, so neutropenia, B cells, T cells, platelets, infection, transformation, uh, and not so much a long-term toxicity. I'm not sure how much auto transplants used in CLL, but you do wonder if you damage marrow and you wanted to do collect stem cells for some reason whether that would be an issue. So which of the agents is more or less toxic? So I put up here what I put up in, in, in this morning about the comparison of the toxicity of FCR versus BR. And again, uh, I think it's pretty clear that FCR has more uh, uh, myeloid bone marrow suppression and risk of infection than BR, although BR did have more thrombocytopenia, so there's clearly marrow suppression with both. And I showed this earlier as well, the prolonged cytopenias, which worry us more than the acute cytopenias, or at least they worry me more because I always worry uh, is this marrow going to recover, is it going to be persistently hypoplastic, or is this a harbinger of myelodysplasia that we've done? And, and the MD Anderson group has looked at this and found that you can get MDS arising out of this situation, you can also get it from patients who recover, but it does seem a little bit higher in these patients who uh, have prolonged cytopenias, presumably because it just reflects we've damaged their marrow more uh, than if uh, patients recover. So this was uh, an old study pre-rituximab. This was an ECOG uh, trial that compared fludarabine and fludarabine cyclophosphamide uh, in previously untreated patients with CLL. And patients in the FC arm all got myeloid growth factor. People in the fludarabine alone arm only got it if they needed it a secondary prophylaxis. And grade, uh, the toxicity in the FC arm was uh, was more. So you had the same, roughly the same grade 3, 4 neutropenia, but that was despite the use of GCSF in the FC arm. Uh, thrombocytopenia was worse, anemia was a little bit worse. So if you think that F and C, the reason we combine them is because there's synergy against the bad guys, there's also synergy against the good guys. And so not surprisingly, we have more short term bone marrow toxicity. So the concern is does that then reflect long term bone marrow toxicity? and that would be measured by therapy-related MDS or AML. And so this came about because I was the ECOG toxicity monitor, and all these ADHERES reports would come across my desk, and I kept seeing these MDS AML after FC, and it made me a little bit nervous. So we did actually look at the data, and this is a, a fairly large study, 140 patients per arm, long follow-up, and there were 13 cases, so accrued incidence of about 5%. Uh, it was not age-related, so it wasn't just older patients getting uh, MDS. 
Median time to this being diagnosed was about five years, typical of most alkylator type uh, uh, secondary AML. Uh, and that time was the same whether they had FC or F. Uh, most of the patients had received the full six cycles of treatment. The cytogenetics reflected DNA damage. Most of them had abnormalities of chromosomes five or seven. So typical to what, what our hypothesis was that this was DNA damage related. Um, it's, the statisticians drove me crazy because it's a little hard to compete with, uh, to know how many patients are alive, and so this compete, cumulative incidence method, which takes care of the com competing risks of death uh, and other uh, problems. And so uh, with this, the crude incidence, as I said, was 5%, but it was about double in the FC arm, nine patients as opposed to four patients in the flutarabine alarm, uh, arm. And the cumulative incidence was, again, a little bit higher because you get rid of the patients who aren't uh, accessible uh, because they're dead or have uh, other events. And uh, then it's almost 5% in the F arm and 8% in the FC arm. So this is not trivial, and these patients don't do very well once they get uh, treated. Their median survival, you can see, was uh, measured in months, typical of most secondary leukemias. Sort of an, uh, all these patients, or most of them, had uh, uh, samples sent for uh, cytogenetics at baseline for their CLL, um, and uh, actually I'll show that in the next slide, but uh, you could argue that, well, they, they had three or four treatments and multiple treatments uh, predisposed to this, but actually in the FC arm, because they did have a longer PFS, seven of the nine patients had no further therapy, so you couldn't implicate second treatments, where in the F arm, three of the four had had additional uh, agents, which included uh, alkylating agents. Uh, interestingly, and I don't know what this means, all the seven patients for whom we had data who had MDS in the FC arm had the IGVH mutated form. Um, so I don't know what that means. I'd be interested to see if it shows up in other data sets. So the incidence seems to be about twofold higher after FC. It takes about five years. Um, so far, we've not seen additional cases. So I think it's like the Hodgkin's data where you know, you see this peak of secondary alkylator-induced um, AML, and then it kind of trails off, so hopefully it won't continue to accumulate. Uh, it looks like DNA damage. Uh, I think I have a slide showing you the uh, uh, CLGB data with f Um And usually it's not due to secondary uh, uh, additional chemotherapy. So you do have to factor this into your downstream thinking if 5% or 8% of patients are going to get secondary uh, AMDS and AML. Uh, whether you want to give that uh, treatment, you have to balance that in the risks and benefits. And here's the table with all the data that's been reported from the different studies. And you can see it's, you know, 3% in, in the original MD Anderson FCR arm. Uh, they've, they've added additional patients and published 4.5%. In the CLGB study, the FCR was, uh, uh, I'm sorry, the, the F chlorambucil was 3.5%, uh, but F alone or chlorambucil alone was quite low. So again, it, it seems to be this flutarabine and alkylator agent combination, which, which is, uh, uh, puts you at high risk. I'm going to skip that. Um, so I mentioned this coming out of early, the persistent cytopenias. Those patients tend to develop their MDS earlier than patients who recovered and might have been four or five years out when they get it. That's in the MD Anderson database. And sometimes it's hard to make the diagnosis. Is this just hypoplasia or a hypoplastic MDS? and cytogenetics and fish may be helpful there, uh, and they don't do well. Uh, transformation, so this is the data on the transformation, um, and if you look at, at the table in the CLGB study that Conti Rai ran, uh, there didn't seem to be a big difference in transformation with uh, uh, any of these agents, whether it was, you defined it as Richter's or prolymphocytic. And the 7% incidence of Richter's is interesting as a baseline in that study if we start worrying about the uh, uh, transformation risk in the BTK inhibitors and other uh, TKIs. Second, malignancies I mentioned are increased in incidence and they have worse outcomes. And maybe we're making that worse when we immune suppress people. Um, but there's no clear data that these were fludarabine induced in, in the original fludarabine uh, uh, cohorts that were treated at the NCI. Uh, but they're clearly patients whose disease takes off early after treating their CLL, and I've seen that anecdotally, and it's been reported. So you do think that there is an immune surveillance role that is uh, doing something to control those malignancies.
So long-term toxicity is primarily bone marrow and immune suppression. We worry about prolonged cytopenias, we worry about infections, secondary MDS, and the fludarabine combination seem to be a little bit worse in terms of the, uh, particularly the, the myelosuppression and, and uh, myeloid indications. And I think what we've learned over the years is even though these novel agents look exciting, and they are exciting, uh, prudence uh, dictates that we monitor these patients carefully for long-term effects. Thank you.